Um, I wrote this paper in uh, September this year, uh, last year, 2018. And uh, as you will see, it's a bit annoying at the end because it's too close to what is happening in France <laughs> right now. So, uh, but the whole discussion was on the topic that you are familiar with, is rising inequalities and reconstruction of the labor capital compromise. Uh, the main contradiction in a way is that uh, we had a labor capital compromise at the end of World War II with some specificity, and then it uh, petered out, it eroded along the years, and um, we find it uh, strange that in democratic societies we still have this kind of growth regime, whether it is a growth regime will be debatable. So I guess you will know a lot of the facts that I will try to uh, take into account, but um, I think it's important to have this overview to appreciate what's going on in our societies, developed societies. I guess it could be also, but it's uh, another kind of exercise done for developing societies. But for developed societies, with whatever happened with Trump, whatever happened in the UK and nowadays in France, you, I mean, I, I, it's part of the discourse and it does mean that the story is not over and still things are, are, are going on. For concerning the, well, it's reacting. Yeah, um, that's a bit of the abstract of the, you all got the, you all got the paper, huh? yes, I guess. I'm sorry, I did not realize that it was a kind of advertisement for the, for the publisher, for the e open access publisher at the front. Um, so, uh, developed economy, rising inequality, a major threat of all contemporary society. For developed economy, it's the expected consequences of trade liberalization and competition with low wage countries. For developing countries, it's more unexpected in a way, and it would be also interesting to consider. Maybe next year I will come back with the other students with the developing economies. And all the more that the Kusnets forecast of the fact that it is a contemporary evolution, and then that uh, there is some restoration of the previous equilibrium, does not seem to be confirmed, huh? really. Uh, after uh, so many years where we have this trend in inequality. Rising uh, within income inequality is what is the topic within, within country and not between country because effectively, as you know, trade, the expansion of trade has reduced the um, inequalities between countries with a reduction of extreme poverty, which was one of the millennial goal of the UN. Okay. Here we are with uh, the Gini coefficient for uh, uh, mainly uh, the Euro I mean not European, but uh, OECD countries. And as you can see, there is a general move move upward. It's not meaningful as it is, especially if you look at this case and you see that in France, for example, there has been very little rise in comparison in uh, uh, inequalities, uh, in income in inequalities. So this general feature, we know that it has political effect and we will know, we will see also that this is one of the measures but one measure which has been become more and more popular is the rise in the 1%, uh, the, the big income. Uh, the Piketty things tend to focus on 1% uh, uh, or even less to show uh, a recent trend in high, in high wage increases. 
What is interesting also is to see in detail what has happened. What is the purpose of this graph in my paper is to show the effect of the Second World War. Here you are, uh, can you, see, you don't see the color, but uh, the, the dark one is, is supposed to be red, and the pre-tax, pre-tax. Ça fait rien, c'est pas, j'ai pas beaucoup de choses en couleur. Okay. We already adapted to the colors of the original. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't have that many colors. It's really washing, Pascal. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, <laughs> so what you see is that the, the level, uh, U.S. income inequality, uh, here you are, there you have a big war effect, things are a big drop, and here you, after the war, it's not really, I mean, there is not a continuous decline, we are in 46, so, so the golden years of capitalism, you globally stay at a similar level. It's not st decreasing, it's at this level. And uh, all, uh, these are the Reagan years, the liberalization, the neoliberal era, and you see a dramatic rise in this pre-tax. Post-tax is giving a, a slightly different figures. It means that the mechanism of market on one side, and on the other side, the ideology of uh, the legitimacy of tax is still in favor of some redistribution and it shows in the until the 1980s where you have a real political change in favor of uh, uh, some liberalization in this distribution of income, more left to market forces. So uh, what is stressed in a way, what is stressed in a way is this graph is uh, the importance of the post-war labor capital compromise. I say compromises and non compromise because a, a major feature will be the fact that it will be different according to country, a diversity from the start. So you, you should know the paper by Kalecki, uh, which is uh, Michael Kalecki 43, which is saying that either capitalism will kind of reconcile with full employment or it will have to be scrapped or a definitive assessment. Uh, an interesting thing that you may not have heard of is the Philadelphia Conference of 44. Philadelphia Conference of 44, it's a, a, a kind of 44, it's already we see that the, 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 the end of the war, uh, the Second World War is coming, and uh, some of these uh, United Nations organisms, as a matter of fact, the ILO, Labor Office, the International Labor Office, trying to resume its activities and organize uh, a big, big gathering in Philadelphia where you have all very strong principles. I mean, it's really kind of contemporary view of what should be the status of labor in our societies when, when you look at that. And I will, I have uh, mentioned some of these principles. And it gathered, I mean, a, a wide majority, even from countries which were outside the OECD and all. They all supported, it's a, it's a big, big, big uh, uh, accord or consensus or in the afterwar period, how should be the world and the world and the, and the, 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 the place of labor in this world. Another name uh, of this period is beverage. And beverage is a key name because he has a, the Englishman, he has a kind of radical view of full employment. And part of the diversity will be we have to have policies uh, pushing for full employment, or we have to realize radically full employment. Everyone has to be employed. The beverage view is more radical, and it will be more installed or diffused in Scandinavian countries, while in countries of uh, continental Europe, you will have much more 
kind of, let's have full employment policy, but there is some lax, there will be some, some unemployment. Uh, but the, the legitimacy of politics will be to act to reduce that. But it will not be uh, a commitment of every administration and all that. Uh, another thing is interesting for the case of France is what we call the Conseil National de la Résistance, the program that developed among the uh, resistance organization as for the future. Another, uh, another name or part of this program is uh, named Les Jours Heureux, The Happy Days. And it's very interesting to see how it looks like by now. So it's a general call for labor protection and full employment policies. And I give you here some, uh, some of the principal one. Ça va pas? Ah, OK. OK. OK, principal one, labor is not a commodity which encapsulates that workers as persons ah, are at the heart of <coughs> labor legislation and should be protected, okay? Freedom of expression and association are essential human rights. So you have the form of democracy associated with the status of labor. And war against poverty required as poverty anywhere constitute a danger to prosperity everywhere. And what? Uh, with, is it, uh, <laughs> with, um, oh, I don't have to move. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> tripartism in which, tripartism is also interesting on what is the democracy which goes with the status given to labor. Tripartism in which the representatives of workers and employers enjoying equal status with those of government join with them in free discussion and democratic decision with a view to the promotion of the common welfare. So it's very clear, and it's an impressive number. You can find, you have the reference of the book by Supio, but it's in French, unfortunately, I guess, on what happened in this conference in Philadelphia. And it's very, very telling of the starting points of this full employment convention. What we have, that's what we, has been called uh, by, by Sean Field in 68, but also much before, was the modern capitalism, the creation of the welfare state following the principle I just reminded. And after, this was 45 and the 50s and 60s, and uh, well, up to the year 2000, that's to say uh, for four decades after, what is surprising, or what was surprising, was the remaining diversity of capitalism. How all these commitments had taken various forms that have been lasting through times, and that is what uh, all in Soski's work, as well as uh, the work I did with Amable on the diversity of capitalism, found that even looking at the, the structure, even looking at uh, uh, the, the various schemes involved to implement this uh, welfare state, this diversity had remained with different systems. So the, but the development of these welfare states with their stability, with their lasting differences, should not be seen, and I think it's an important fact that we tend to forget, should not be seen as without conflictuality. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I have been myself surprised being used to call these years the golden years of capitalism, which is a name given by, in the literature by uh, 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 Shaw, Juliette Shaw and uh, Marlene. Uh, the golden years of capitalism have not been experimented by the workers as golden years. You have to see the conflictuality and the fact that they, the, the battling on in every country, 
especially because effectively there were some margin of adjustment in this full employment policy and all that. So it has been a period where for a lot of advance in wages, in, in labor protection, you had some conflictualities that you can follow through strikes, uh, number of strikes, and even the profile of strike by sector, by type of issue, is very different of our country and very interesting. But at some point, you realize in the 60s that people are really effectively considering that things have changed. And, and they refer to, that's my point, the American way of life. The cars, again, that's it. The cars, the importance of having a car, having some time to wander around with a car, the equipment, the housing, all that becomes a reality when in the middle of the 60s, end of the 60s, even with all the things about 68, it's when the change, the full employment convention, and the turn toward a consumer society kind of become clear. And it's important to understand what follows. What follows is that uh, all these full employment conventions, to be compatible with their diversity at a global at a global level. That's all. That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, uh, to be compatible at a global level, you have this diversity, full employment, they are exchanging, you need to have a global pattern of governance. These were the Bretton Woods institution and at the, at the middle of it, the role of the dollar, the gold standard via the dollar. All that collapses for various reasons, uh, of which the cost of the Vietnam War and all that, collapse in the early 70s, as you, as you all know. What will come after is a period of inflation and a big change in the relationship to this labor capital compromise. Uh, by the way, the 70s are strangely enough also a period where the environmental issue is rising. But eff effectively, it was well known, but nobody acts anymore. The Meadows report of 72 uh, just went by without uh, much concern or people taking action. They knew that the industrial development that we were uh, following was to be short life or was to, be to, to, to lead us to big problems. But no echo, no much echo. 72, nearly nothing. Then we have the change in the gold exchange standard, the weakening of the global governance through the Bretton Woods Agreement, inflation, and the beginning of this flexibilization of labor market, which is going to be killing for the full uh, employment uh, commitment. For example, in 75 in France, we reached something like uh, one million unemployed. And it was supposed to be totally crazy. There was really, s people were totally shocked by, by that, which is a good thing. But uh, um, it, it is very telling of uh, uh, how this adjustment was kind of difficult. And difficult between uh, how to keep this full employment, but also how to keep this access to, let's say, the American way of life, huh? the, the house, the car, and all that. So uh, the fact that we turn and we leave a bit this priority to full employment uh, policies has to be seen with this kind of uh, bargaining between full employment policy or we get, we get the deal, we get the consumption package, okay? That was a key issue, in my view, in the fact that the people like Reagan and Thatcher, 
which are rather populist, they are not uh, part of some elite, they are more middle class people talking to middle class people. An important impact was let's go on with this trade liberalization because you will benefit in terms of consumer surplus. It means your cars, your equipment, not your housing, but that uh, will be that. It's a kind of a weak argument, but still we have to keep that in mind in the feasibility of the turn towards a more flexible labor market. It's to keep uh, access to this uh, cheap goods and to this, in, in other, which is a temptation all, all along of the system to pretend that part of this uh, destruction of the full employment compromise will end up with other goodies, eh? other advantage, access to other advantage. We shall see that also with finance. Anyway, uh, I like the term that Jill with a uh, political scientists use with a, a silent revolution. It's really a revolution if you consider the commitment of all this country to full employment policy, welfare state, that this turn towards mar labor market liberalization. Okay. And this silent revolution by the 90s, the turn is in the 80s, by the 90s, it will be comforted by uh, the demise of the communist alternative, which was really a kind of uh, uh, blocking uh, alternative. It, you could not know, there was kind of still a competition between systems. When it is lost, the silent revolution as a kind of free road towards much more uh, uh, liberal liberalization, uh, primacy to market forces, really free marketers as they had. Uh, to, come on, to support the importance I give to this argument of the consumer society, I just remind you of the, the fate of Ralph Nader in the US. Ralph Nader was part of this consumer society. Uh, 68 was full of, uh, yes, we are individualist society going for consumer, but be preserve social relationship, do not be over dominated by uh, uh, this consumer type of attitude. Beware of that. Huh? So it's an important issue at the turn of the, of the 80s. And Ralph Nader has a, make a short apparition. He was once a candidate for the US presidency. For those who remember that or who have read about that, <laughs> if not. He was, uh, and then he, he, he disappeared completely. And uh, if you look at his biography, you will see he was really a bit, a, a bit at a loss in, in, in this game. Anyway. The rising role of finance in all that. So you have, in this period of the 80s, um, this kind of uh, uncertainties about the commitment in favor of full employment policies, the idea that we have to have a little bit of flexibilization. We cannot say that our societies destroyed their welfare state with system, their welfare schemes, or social schemes, but really it started being effective. But in the meantime, in the meantime, and uh, while there was no big discussion about that, in the meantime, finance did de facto took big advantage of this liberalization of finance, uh, of trade and, and mobility of capital. They quickly organized at the world level without any political discussion, commitment, and bargaining. It was never pressed. You can find, if you want, a long list of bashing of finance. Every time it's, uh, I mean, I don't know what Steve <laughs> told you this morning, but uh, you never found a, a political movement or opinion, movement of opinion in favor of this liberalization. It was a fact and uh, with more and more importance, and you have a lot of declaration, very strong, uh, until uh, Hollande 
Finance is my enemy, my enemy. It's, not, it's a very strong word at this presentation, present, presidential campaign. But you find a lot, a lot of these declarations, interestingly. And never though, finance uh, could organize at the world level very rapidly and was there then imposed. Even, even though in this transformation, it's also interesting to see how financial services did took care of an impoverished working class. I mean, all these lending mechanism to people who are in very poor situation, it was an alternative. I spoke of uh, the attachment to the American way of life package, but here, here was financed, but I can help you to have that. I can lend you some money and all that in condition which, as you have seen, with um, the um, subprime crisis were kind of catastrophic. I mean, it was a real internal game to finance, uh, which uh, was going into the wall, even according to major uh, directors or managers of financial institutions. Uh, the number of people who say, this is totally crazy, this business is totally crazy. Part of what I called, uh, and you can ask uh, at what our next conference or seminars <laughs> to what extent they found it really crazy, uh, as, I, as I said. Okay, so we we had entered uh, subreptitiously in a world of financial crisis, and financial crises are back if we refer to long time before or the interwar interwar period. And little is done to counter this trend. And on top of that, this trend is completing the internationalization of the economies well, as it fuels mergers and acquisition, which are a key issue in the construction of global value chain, <coughs> which are fragilizing even more and more the workers in various developed countries till the global financial crisis of 2008, where not only you have the finance bashing, but you see the extent of uh, the, the waste and the destruction. Challenge of coordination among developed countries to stop the trend uh, were not successful. This financialization uh, has also spurred, and I already mentioned that, the rise of uh, extremely high wage, uh, to quote Obama, obscene wages, like ghost to other guys. And these high wages, a lot of people have written of these obscene wages, and it's also part of this bashing, because these obscene wages are uh, strongly tied to uh, the financialization because uh, the financial services have spread the world, the world that a good, uh, if you have a good enterprise, then the CEO is well paid. So well paid CEOs become the equivalent of an efficient uh, firm, which means a good uh, result for the stakeholders. All these logics that have been developed have been internal to the system. No, it did not imply any inter usual intermediary discussion with trade union, discussion in the democratic institution of all kinds. It was purely internal. And to find out about these financial, uh, these high wages of CEOs, you have to go inside and see <coughs> what are the pressure, what is the opinion of uh, on the um, stock markets, and how these are used as indicators of efficient enterprise. OK, uh, I will make a, a, a small, uh, how shall we say, uh, di digression, <laughs> small digression. Um, I am a regulationist, OK? You may have heard already some of these guys. No, never. Never? No. OK. <laughs> and uh, we use the term regime. And I think that we have abused the term regime 
in speaking of financialization as a growth regime, especially because it's the politics that goes around. You cannot have, in my sense, a, a, a financialization as a growth regime when you have such a uh, gap in terms, uh, in political terms, such bashing and all that. So it's something like a transition, and this is to kind of uh, say that we have been in a transition for quite a while uh, in this, um, with this financialization more than in a growth regime which will develop openly as we had with uh, the welfare state, welfare state regime. So, uh, despite some of its attractiveness, financialization is not, for me, a proper growth regime, as we should uh, understand uh, it in the regulation theory. Despite also the success of finance studies, this is very interesting. In the year 2000, you see in all these big institutions, education institutions in the US, I mean, a large percentage of the cohort going to work, or willing to work in financial institutions. Even the balance between departments in university has been reconsidered in this period because the people working in economics and in finance wanted to be much more well paid than historians or people uh, <laughs> like that. You know. And uh, uh, Colander, I quote Colander, Colander work, I think they are very interesting to show the attraction and now the low tide. It has been reversed after the 2009 and, and uh, the, the bashing. And I'm glad to have with EPOG a cohort which is not <laughs> looking or expecting to go so strongly into finance. Okay, so no legitimacy. Uh, I hope I am not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see, you, I, I, well, we can explain, we can discuss that afterwards. Anyway, uh, no legitimacy, I will less in democratic society. When you don't have any legitimacy for such an important uh, network of activity as finance, how is it, what is the relation, how is it supported <coughs> in democratic societies? There is this notion of a post-democracy era, what does it mean? And that's, here I am entering a bit in what our societies are expressing today with all various kind of movement, this kind of disjunction and this lack of democracy or the need for other form of democracy. A void that has fueled what uh, we consider the so-called populist movement, and I will say some words about that, but still staying in the framework of this paper done before the yellow, <laughs> yellow <laughs> jacket. So towards an era of new capital labor compromise. A wide questioning. First of all, uh, a success in that direction is the success of Piketty's book. Piketty has been selling millions of books around the world on an issue simply of inequality of income uh, among um, wage earners and all that, uh, insisting especially on the 1%, but also giving an idea of the general trend, the part of the general trend. And it is surprising, I mean, I always, want, I always wanted to have some idea of who bought, for example, one million copies sold in the US. Who has bought them? Who has read? We know that few have read thoroughly. You can buy a book and just go through it. And they have techniques to, to know uh, until which page you have been. But it would be interesting to know more about that. Are they, are they executive of big enterprise? Who are they? Was, who were the, the, the readers of Piketty's book? It's interesting. It, it's a societal phenomenon. Still, uh, its, its policy recommendation with tax on wealth had had very little echo. Very little echo. We may come back on that. 
uh, still it is a, a noticeable contribution to the consciousness of the unsatisfying states of our society. It's really something that is shared worldwide, this unsatisfaction with the present state of inequality, income inequality around the world in the different society. Uh, it is an active determinant of our class struggle. An interesting thing that uh, has been has come back in view of Piketty's book is the fact that a similar phenomena had happened at the end of the 19th century with a book by Henry George, who, saw, who sold at the time three million copies. Uh, and uh, it has been very influential, and I guess uh, Piketty has also been very influential. Uh, it is, for example, at the origin of the Fabian Society in the UK. Uh, but uh, we can question also why it was not more, uh, it had not a, a bigger impact on political life, uh, commitment, the kind of uh, uh, full employment commitment that we have. Why we don't have so many charters following this movement of opinion? The thing is that it seems that such manifesto have to be very precise on how you are going to use the tax, and it echoes things that you can see all around Europe, the states and that. What do you do with the tax? How, and I come back to this materiality. It's, fu it's funny, if I may say so, that the uh, yellow jacket have started with this story of uh, going from 90 km per hour to 80. The way in you, you can use the environment, you can benefit, you can, the way in which your practical arrangement are more or less constrained, still feasible. Or so the materiality is important. And uh, Bruno Latour, whom I, I quote uh, for another thing, has uh, recently said that the big difference between the fight that we mentioned with the labor uh, full, full employment commitment, there were battles for right, when what we see nowadays are much more battles for material condition. And it's very interesting, in my opinion, because these material conditions will, at some point, include also the environmental condition. Not only the goods you can have access, the services you can have access, but also maybe the quality of life. And this is telling you where I was pushing in that direction in my paper, is to say <coughs> that the new big accord will have to take much more into account the detail of the way of life, a reminder of the Fordist model for the thing, access, uh, service, exact, but also the environmental condition, which is also a key issue. The same Bruno Latour was in the same spirit saying that the, the climate threat, the environmental change is an abstraction, if you keep to that. If you go to a local level, according to what is changed or threatened precisely, it makes sense. <coughs> so this idea is strengthening, and the fact that, and all what we observe, is strengthening the fact that any new kind of uh, compromise or accord of what our society, Marquand society or capitalist society, will work on, We'll have to, this accord will be grounded and worked out uh, at, at, at a very local level. Uh, okay, I'm clearly near the end. A populist moment. So when we see all, all this, well, um, again, like I echo something by Chantal Mouffe, uh, political scientist. Uh, the period for them is a populist moment. I guess that, so, so looking at the, the whole perspective that I just stressed, you can see the difference between populist movements and populist moments. At some point, 
the, the question is still what is to bargain exactly? Are they right? Are they structure of democracy in this post-democracy era? And I will add, uh, are they uh, things which have to do with the environment? It's important to see that the uh, proponent and opponent are divided. And it's more explained than in my, um, it's more explained in the paper. Uh, at the end of the day, when you look at the political forces, I'm not going to speak of really the populist movement, but uh, those who can support them or not, there can be an alliance between what they ask for, what the populist movement put on the agenda, and the fact that some people engage or uh, were um, elite or upper middle class which were in favor of the liberalization of trade, consciously, may understand that it has to be much more control. Much more control for environmental reason, uh, much more control for control on the uh, various power. So it's not, I, I will not say protectionism, but a, a controlled trade based on uh, norms, based on even uh, uh, maybe protection of some trade, of some local organization uh, that I will stress later on. So environmental issues are back and can be part of this research. And it's interesting to see and to look at the present uh, uh, populist movement in that direction, although there are a lot of contradiction, effectively. A lot of contradiction because it's not it does not, not come that clear. It has to be worked out at local level to understand a bit more. New alliances, importance of local level to set new compromise on sustainable uh, growth development paths. The general framework of the sustainable development goals offers a kind of global framework for this global governance to take place. Um, and uh, uh, on this debate, uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, clearly the development, the distinction between misery and poverty. Poverty is something where you can, in a way, uh, and it has been the object of the previous Millennium Goal, you can uh, deliver, redistribute and some money and uh, rise a bit the income. Misery is much more, has much more to do with the power citizens have on uh, their lives, the, the, the sustainability of their uh, life patterns a long time. So it's an interesting also uh, distinction. And you can hear in some of the claims of the Euro jacket, but also of Trump electorate or of the Brexiters, that, uh, that th some of these claims are really sounding uh, in a way in that direction. So there is still, to have this, to, 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 to see this problem, <coughs> let's, six months ago, does not mean that it is clear that these re-alliances will take place, but it shows uh, uh, relation with uh, uh, the battles against these free trade argument, uh, agreements uh, uh, among continents, and some of these uh, some of these battles for new form of, of democracy. Uh, this will be my last uh, slide. Seventeen. I will tell you after why seventeen. 70 articles in the Declaration of uh, the Human Rights and 17 SDGs. So I stop at 17. Uh, so SDGs are framing the whole thing. They are rather, uh, rather uh, co comprehensive. And something which has to be made to be clarified and which is very important, and I am especially looking at all these social movement protests in that direction, in the way in which they are uh, producing new form, innovative form of activities 
and especially non-market activities. Be it the, uh, among some kind of commons, and you have a lot, uh, have a lo a lot on commons. And to favor that, they have also to rethink some basic income scheme so that you can develop on this basis a lot of non-market services that will help to restructure the social link locally and be confronting to the new challenge on environment and the like. Okay, I will stop. Question is for you. Uh, hello everyone. So uh, we are presenting on uh, on a new compromise between capital and labor. I am Zahid from Pakistan. He is uh, <coughs> Paul from Germany and Francisco from Italy. So our topic is, uh, as you all know, and then the outline of the presentation is as follows. Like we will talk about um, a bit like slight recap of the what you presented and then followed by our own presentation, our own uh, observations. And then we will have some discussion questions. So after the World War II, uh, there was a huge unemployment and a lot of proposals were uh, asking for the revision of capitalism. And one of them was basically Michael Kalecki, who <coughs> said that either capitalism has to ensure full unemployment or it has to perish. So this idea led to modern capitalism, which was known by Schoenfeld in 1968. And after 1970s oil crisis, there was a slowdown of economic growth in the Western countries mm -hmm. and followed by huge unemployment again. So they wanted to uh, fight against this unemployment as uh, a reduction in inflation. So they had to open their economies, liberalize their economies as a main mot motto. This led to a new financial regime and hollowing out of the full employment <coughs> convention. So th this is just the... Uh, graph from the paper, as we already discussed in the presentation. So let's move on. So there is a huge discussion between the idea of absolute or relative inequality in the literature and which measurement is better and how much does it matter. <coughs> so if you look at the graph, there is an increase in absolute inequality within countries all, ac all across the world. But at the same time, there is decrease in rising inequ um, uh, relative inequality across the globe. So <coughs> why this is? decreasing relative in, uh, inequality, it's a bit interesting because they usually measure it by the Gini coefficient or the Palma index, which is basically just the ratio of the income of the rich and the poor, and it's not a true representative of the economic gap between the two. <coughs> so the idea is that if there is 1% increase income growth for rich and 2% for poor, they, they would say that the relative inequality is actually decreased, even though the economic uh, gap is quite huge. <coughs> So how we can link it uh, with, with the process of internationalization? So with the process of interna internationalization, basically there is a huge income growth in the developing countries, right? And there is a uh, poverty elevation of millions of people uh, out of the uh, ex extreme poverty condition. So can we argue that <coughs> the idea of uh, relative inequality, if you are focusing on elevation, should we favor more internationalization of the economies? And if you are focusing more on reducing the absolute inequality, can we say that it's more inclined towards populism which in the context of paper, which is against the internationalization process? Or maybe within internationalization, we can argue that it's more of a monitored economy, where you have, which is a leftist position, and we have labor unions and wage bargaining uh, organizations working for the labor conditions. So <coughs> just to sum up uh, the process of globalization basically it re reduces poverty, which is uh, relative inequality, but also fuels the absolute inequality within countries. So can we see globalization as a solution to reduce inequality, or we either can't say protectionism is a solution. So what would be the alternative? And Francisco will carry on the discussion. So moving on the, let's say, second part of the paper. Uh, what uh, Pascal discusses is the possibility for new uh, solidarities that emerge from two splits, one inside the populist movements around the uh, silence uh, on income inequalities because the uh, migration issues seem to really mold the 
electorate and on the other end we have the internationalist positions that split on uh, the monitoring of markets uh, and in particular on the increase or decrease of uh, non-tariff barriers because as he points out in the in the paper it's very likely that a further decrease in the tariff barriers will uh, in some in some way damage at least some of the of the parts will not uh, benefit all so from these two splits there's a room for a reconstruction of a new left around the search for uh, sustainable development uh, and like these these new solidarities uh, uh, and these uh, Reconstruction depends on uh, what will be uh, looked for, and uh, uh, so a new left if it's possible if the new aims are uh, connected to uh, short production consumption circuits or uh, circular economy. But it's uh, more likely that this kind of new left is developed at the uh, local level, as, as Latour uh, expressed, uh, versus the abstraction of commitments uh, at the national and supranational uh, level. And it's also necessary to uh, relay this uh, local action at the national and international level. Uh, but these multi-level ar arrangements can uh, take time that we might not have due to the ecological uh, urgencies. So uh, what can be the signifier of this new left in order to uh, co accomplish these uh, several issues? Uh, Pascal proposes in the paper that sustainable development goals can uh, provide a framework for a global uh, uh, left in in this sense because they allow for uh, multiple level of actions uh, and they have the potential to restore the citizenship status uh, and to fight both poverty uh, and and uh, misery and leading to a modern capitalism uh, number number two so uh, I, I thought that uh, it could be uh, really useful in order to analyze the possibilities for uh, a new social settlement in the uh, current economic conjuncture to look at the uh, analytical framework of Ernesto Lanclo, which is one of the mentors of Chantal Mouffe that Pascal uh, mentioned. He basically says that when we use the uh, term populism, uh, an actual meaning is presupposed in our linguistic practice, but this is hardly translatable in any uh, meaningful sense, and it's also really hard to find uh, uh, an, an example of it because too many exceptions come up to our uh, mind. So what he proposes is to analyze the political discourse uh, on the base of its uh, ontological logic form rather than its ontic content, which means that our unit of analysis should uh, shift from the movements and the, ideo and the ideologies to the uh, mode of, of articulation of, uh, social, of the practices of social agents. So the political discourse is uh, intended here as a mode of articulation of social demands and in particular populism would be uh, that mode of articulation that consists in the creation of a popular subject. So we might say that to a certain extent all politics uh, is populist and so it's not a matter of what is populist or not but to, to uh, which uh, extent. Uh, and how this uh, popular subject is created to the creation of a frontier in the social space uh, and so to the through the constitution of an historical agent that is an underdog, a loser, uh, that fades an, an enemy, in this case the international uh, institutions. This is uh, then all the different social demands are uh, brought together in this uh, chain of equivalence, as uh, he called them where this, despite the differences, the equivalence moment, that is the unsatisfaction of these, uh, of these demands, allow them to, to stay uh, close uh, together. And this further consolidated by uh, the identification of a signifier that in the case of populist movement, uh, uh, as is political power in being empty, and especially in the most extreme case, taking the figure of a leader, as many of those we can uh, imagine uh, in this uh, in this period. But the more demands join this equivalent chain, the weaker their link with their signifier. And this means that this signifier is constantly floating uh, and expose the political discourses to possible destabilizations and transformations that are the tensions that uh, Pascal uh, uh, raised in, uh, in his paper, both inside the populist movements uh, ab around inequalities and uh, uh, on uh, internationalism. So this chain of equivalence can be broken, but what I wanted to stress is that 
new solidarities can emerge both for the right and for the left. Uh, and this depends on how much this equivalence overtakes the difference in social demand. So my question is, uh, a new left or a stronger right? And is the, are the social development goals uh, uh, capable of building this new left in a timely way? So both against the ecological crisis, but also against the political crisis and the mutual reinforcement. Um, you know, I th we continue in this uh, in this sense, but uh, we're going to move to uh, a framework of Nancy Fraser, which I think resembles a little bit the structure that uh, you explained in the paper. Um, she's um, putting uh, against each other progressive neoliberalism and reactionary, uh, reactionary populism. And uh, she coins that term progressive neoliberalism because she talks of an alliance uh, a coalition between the progressive social identity movements like feminism, multiculturalism and the LBGTQ um, community with the carefree uh, high-end service sector like Silicon Valley, Wall Street and Hollywood. And I would say um, in order to form a, a new left movement, um, here, here lies the, here lies the uh, important, uh, important aspect because we have to clearly distinct economic politics from identity politics um, and uh, feminism, LGBTQ and multiculturalism who are, uh, which concern with individuals that were highly um, diminished in the history of humankind uh, were of course in favor of their um, prosperous situation, for example, by Bill Clinton in 1992, who uh, le lent them an ear and uh, expanded on so-called feminist, uh, feminist project, but at the same time liberalized the uh, free market to a huge extent. Uh, and they s uh, stand uh, at the moment against each uh, against reactionary populist movements like the like Trump, who resemble the losers of globalization. So uh, the industrial workers. I mean, uh, it's if we look at the elephant curve from Branco Milano, which they, these are the people who are uh, in this bottom um, bottom spot, um, and their previous hegemonic position uh, and their way of life is uh, is threatened and. Um, and therefore, they get to the reactionary populist movements. Uh, and what I uh, would say is that there is a need of an alliance of emancipation and social protections against financialization. And we have to uh, fight this. Um, this uh, letting uh, feminism or LGBTQ movements getting hijacked from companies like Starbucks. Um, and uh, in the sense, uh, to form a new left, we have to realize that there's uh, these two important streams in the left movement, which can be resembled by cosmopolitanism and communitarian, uh, communitarianism, uh, which com uh, cosmopolitanism basically is founding on the uh, theory of justice from John Rawls, uh, where you, uh, his like mind game is that you get behind of a wheel of ignorance where you don't know anything about your uh, characteristics and then you have to agree upon with all the other people on what just institutions for everybody would be and uh, he argues that um, you wouldn't uh, you would then form just institutions because nobody wants to be worse off um, but in that sense the principal task of government is to secure and distribute fairly the liberties and economic resources individuals need to lead uh, lead freely chosen lives. Um, but on the other hand, stand communitar communitarian scholars like David Miller, Alison McIntyre and Michael Warsaw, who say uh, that cultural aspects of society are far more important um, and that justice uh, must be found in forms of life and traditions of particular societies, that, that cultural factors factor into um, the justification of rights, uh, can provide moral foundations of distinctive political practices and can affect the prioritizing of rights and that the Rawlsian liberalism rests on an overly uh, individualistic con uh, conception of the self. Um, so the, um, the movements we talked previously about and the, uh, the agenda has to be that these two have to be brought together and Chantal move and I can only highly recommend uh, this book uh, which came out in 2018 for left populism, advocates in this 
populist moment, which uh, Pascal also talked about, to now form a, a, a new left. And uh, because she argues, as um, Francesco also already touched upon, because she's highly intertwined with Laclau, uh, that um, populism is not an ideology or uh, attached to a specific um, programmatic point. And um, because she sees the threat that everybody who fights against the dogma of the consensus right now is called a populist, and the, that the populist term is um, so negatively uh, connotated. Um, but she argues that uh, left populism aims at deepening democracy through and uh, bundling it into a specific col a political will uh, where we once again form a we against they, so the people versus the oligarchy, um, but that can only be uh, realized if, uh, if, the, uh, if, it's, if the identity political side of liberalism is which is in the core a leftist uh, agenda is brought together with a more localized economy. And uh, this was, would be the question that I, um, what I want to ask is because in the paper you refer to basic income programs and I, maybe it's just a definition problem, but I see a general basic income as a highly liberal uh, agenda. And I don't know if you uh, think, the, think the same of it, but um, you talked about a uh, need for localization and the uh, social linkages in a, uh, in a society and therefore I would rather advocate for an employer of last resort where you bring people together to work on common goals um, rather than just providing them uh, with money and uh, letting them um, decide on what to do with it. You just got lots of extra points. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this would, this would be our, uh, our questions other than the ones we already raised, uh, new left or strong right is, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you can uh, now answer to yeah. our yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. to our questions, and yeah. if you finish with that, we open yeah. the floor okay. for okay. general okay. discussion. Okay, I do that. I do that. Ah, first, first, congratulations to have. <laughs> extended the subject and taken advantage of uh, the present situation <laughs> around the world. Uh, it was well done. Um, I, th I think for you, I have uh, the big apology, which is not well uh, stressed in the paper, is that I am mainly focusing on uh, developed economies. And I am not at all, I will say we can raise similar issues, but it will be much more tentative looking at developing economy. I'm not opposing, I mean, saying uh, let's, uh, let's get rid of the uh, liberalization of trade. It's only benefit uh, developing country and it's too costly for the other thing. I think there is also, but uh, no, no, not, it's not part of the same paper, but uh, we are working on what's going on in Asia in that respect. Uh, there is uh, uh, something which is rather similar on the destruction brought by purely market forces. Uh, I take the example, I'm working on the ASEAN countries, and which are all over tr very different. And uh, they have, I mean, part of the, in part of the story for the developed economies, there was a change from rural population to urban population. It's a big move of the time. It's a big move of the golden years. And similarly, uh, we see the difficulties to achieve that in a regional area like ASEAN. So uh, the control of trade and exchange and the control of markets, let's say, purely. Uh, it's, uh, we, we should find good reason to much more control market forces. Because nowadays, I mean, the, the, the benefits that you have it's much has been much depending of all the, the whole system of global value chain, which is very unsteady and has a uh, uh, lot of... So it's, a, it's another issue. And um, that's why I was not really opposing uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I, it's easy to recall that there has been a reduction in poverty, but it's, uh, the whether, whether uh, it does not imply, it, it does imply that it should go in like that, it's, uh, it's not at all the same question. It's much more tricky, and you know that. So. <laughs> but it's another paper. I will come back next year <laughs> for, for that. For both of you, you have, uh, you have been, you, you know more than I do in, uh, 
certain move this political authority. And I think, and I think, and part of my message is that we have really to work closely with the political scientists developing this kind of view. So I much agree. I much agree on that. Um, it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> It's a bit difficult for your question, L'Enclos, MOOF, and uh, signifiers and all that. We, um, it's a bit difficult to, and uh, again, uh, my answer will be kind of the same for both of you. That is to say, uh, all these play on signifiers, social demands, and the manipulation. Um, is, and important things will be the local and taking and more communitarian in that respect, uh, in the distinction that you take, which impact also on your on your answer, uh, saying that uh, the good bargaining will be found. The good bargaining will be found. There, need, there is a need to have this kind of idea on the legitimacy as a overall level, and that's where the basic income comes into things. Basic income is. Uh, full of ambiguity. It goes from the right to the left. But it's interesting because it's raising, it's raising questions of uh, what kind of activity, what kind of needs, what kind of social demands can be developed and all that. And uh, uh, employer of uh, last resort, yes, but uh, we have to, I mean, uh, there is a view of, uh, there is a schematic view of employer of last resort. It, it comes to that. It's come to uh, mapping some kind of uh, activities which uh, um, give you a kind of a citizenship, a new status to the citizenship. Okay, and uh, basic income, the nice thing is that uh, uh, it's it's it has a lot of issues, which are the issues that that, that you raised. It does not comes with a solution. It says what kind of needs do we have according to society, uh, according also locally to the type of environment, because this is where the specificity of our environment are also playing their game. As for uh, uh, all the debate on populism, I fully agree with wha what you said, but it's, it's changing. It started being a, a kind of accusation a uh, to signify exclusion, to signify oversimplification. But even in the process of the Gilets Jaunes right now, there is a kind of sophistication. Uh, we are getting out of that. We are not anymore thinking of that. Uh, there is an issue. I mean, 80% of the population in this country understand that there are good, that there is something which is far from uh, what the populism was meant before, is to, to, was to exclude like, people who are, don't know what they are speaking of. They see the, the complexity is appealing and there is a, I mean, uh, kind of normalization or simplification. And the debate will help in that respect. But it's still, um, it's still difficult to know, for example, uh, I've been interested in, uh, uh, NDDL, <laughs> that is to say, the ZAD, Zone uh, Détruire, and all that. All these. Uh, <laughs> Notre Dame des Landes. <coughs> Notre Dame des Landes, is this, yeah. Yeah, because it, it, there is a lot of creative activities into that. How can they be taken, diffused, and managed, and which social movement try to expand and generate activity? And in my view, it's. Uh, it's a bit of uh, Mao spontex or Mao sp <laughs> Maoist spontaneity, but it's to look at what kind of social uh, innovation are diffusing in specific local contexts like that, and how these can be supported. And this is decisive about the scheme. It can be an employer of last resort, but what uh, the importance again, Bruno Latour, is what you are going to do in a way. Effectively, uh, a lot of things uh, I have taken the word materiality from f fighting for rights to fighting for some uh, possibility to use things, even to have access to internet and all these things, you know, but to have access to services to organize and kind of things like that. Uh, there is a, a current that you may know, municipalism, that is to say, at the level of city, locally, organizing and all that. Uh, we, we see a lot of wonderful experience at local level, 
and sometimes they come by rea they come by reaction, like uh, uh, called, uh, there is a term in France called saillant, very interesting. They they refuse the supermarket, as this supermarket was going to destroy a lot of things, and from that they discover the kind of activity that they can have and all that. So you see that you are in a, in a position where the job can differ. You will be mobilized, you will be part of the citizenship, but the kind of job may, may change a long time. And we need to have, at a, a higher level, a kind of charter of legitimizing this kind of uh, designing of activities according to the needs pr with some uh, specific uh, um, right of use or uh, access to services. The notion of uh, the, the materiality of the is very important. Access to education, health, and that, to speak in terms of access to these benefits. Even of leisure, for example, in, in this rural uh, urban connection. So uh, we, we, we need to have, and that, uh, fully to ensure this uh, condition, you will have a lot of various activities. Whether you uh, do that with a basic scheme or with your employer of last resort depends on how you can differentiate uh, and uh, how the employer of last resort is not uh, two central things far away from the needs of the people. But if you make the arrangement such that, for example, Uber has been very successful. Huh? It has been a very successful. Uh, you should wonder why it is a multinational company. Why you have not defined the right of exploitation and platform such as it can be done at a local level with specific condition on the drivers and all that and it's kind of a communal services. And a lot of the digital economy, the platform economies allows you to kind of shift the thing like that. Basic income, one of in the debate, the basic income there is a the fam the famous uh, Please, that the surfer will get money for that, and it, uh, it has a lot of, uh, of the dead hand and, and, and all that. But there is also the fact that it will cost too much. But never the basic income can be partly uh, monetary, partly free access to some kind of services, and partly built on um, local, local monies. I mean, local monetary arrangement, you see. So you have a wide variety. That's why the, I think that the debate on basic income in that respect is interesting because it obliges you in a way to, uh, the first question people ask is, uh, so what do they do? Are they inactive? Are you, are you suppressing a, a part? If you want to make interactive relations and all that, you enrich a lot the solution. So the, for me, it's a good debate. But it's far from, I mean, the problem is the, the time it takes to, to, to reach uh, elaboration, to, to have this uh, precise proposal, to transform it into a kind of political movement where you see the specificity of local situation, but you see also the common principle that they all share. Okay? I will stop there, there yeah. for to ask the question of the other, but uh, you really are... Uh, in a good position, and I appreciated your, your, your comments. And sorry for the developing country. I will come back. <laughs> or you will come back. Um, my name is Louisa. I'm from the development track. And <coughs> I would go back to the, um, yeah. the discussion on countries. <laughs> so I think also that you, something that you mentioned before was that within country inequality is rising and between country inequality is decreasing. And that is very often said and I think it kind of hides some issues. First that this decreasing in between country inequality is um, largely uh, due to China and if you remove China from the equation that's not really, you don't yeah. observe a significant decreasing okay. in between yeah. country inequality. Okay. Yeah. And second, that if you take a world view, like not dividing between countries, and you take this general world inequality, it's not really due to within country inequalities. That has a very small influence in the world level inequality. It's mostly because of between country inequality. And then going more to the discussion on the social pact and, and 
yeah, how can we construct this compromise? I think if we think of this golden age of capitalism in European countries, um, this social compact was really based on this view of a homogenous society, a culturally and, and um, even ethnically um, homogenous society. And do we want to go back to that? Like, is that something that we aim for? And today, we know that these waves of migration were not huge and still like, they engendered so much political problems. And what kind of social compact do we want? And how do we, how do we, we deal with n the borders and nations? Because as it is, inequality for real, it's, it's between countries. So do we want to just reinforce this um, bubble of privileged European <laughs> social compact, you know, even if it's super homogenous? Or do we want to question that? And how do we want to deal with, with migration, for example? Are we just going to block Europe from everything else? Or, you know, even if we have universal basic income, for whom? Okay, good. You want to answer one by one? Or uh, no, this is a very important issue, uh, which, is, which has to do... Uh, well, first, you, you, you are right that uh, the reduction of poverty and the reduction of inequality between countries has to be seen with some outlier like China and all that. And I mean, so that's uh, okay. OK. But uh, it was to answer the fact that trade has been helping. This is the fate of global value chain. What will become of this global value chain depends on the capacity of the country to kind of constrain the investment. And, well, but this is another issue. The issue which is not in that, uh, in what we said before, and no, I don't know what they said, and which is very important, is what you said in terms of migration. Uh, the social compact that we have to, and this should have been a point, which is only marginally stressed in my paper, is going from uh, the big transformation is rural urban at the time. Urbanization, the American way of life. It's, uh, that's why maybe, and, and a lot of, uh, I, I insisted on the conflictuality, but a lot of this conflictuality was specially based on uh, this transformation of uh, agriculture and uh, the, the, all that. So that's uh, the thing. Uh, it is true that the societies we are with are less, I mean, uh, more mixed, okay? And you raise the special issue of migration, and it, it, it's, a, it's a real issue, considering the existing uh, difference of levels and all that. Um, I have not attached it, uh, I have not kind of looked at it. I can tell you, for example, they are experimenting in a uh, town in the north, uh, a, a, a basic income scheme at Grand Sainte. You, some of you may have seen the film Grand Sainte. No? No one? Just go and see. It's, part, uh, it's interesting. It's an, a town in the north, uh, very close to industrial site, and they are developing a lot of uh, what I call non-market, uh, no, I mean, all, all kind of uh, um, s uh, local, local activities. Uh, you share services, you have monies of some kind, you share times, you spend some time in gardening with the others, and all these kind of things. And in that case, uh, the basic income still, uh, they, they require that you have been living in the place for the last three years. Uh. But it's a obviously a big issue, uh, which has to be, I don't know how to, uh, honestly, uh, it can be looked at. Uh, the strong point in migration, a driving force, is the fact, uh, the one of the pulling factors is the existing community. So uh, you can, for example, see the, what happened with the Gilets Jaunes. As a, uh, there was an opportunity to revive rural towns to be very welcoming to migrants. But clearly, it's a two dividing issue, and they, no, no one spoke of that. But effectively, when you look at the condition in some places where do you, you are not enough people to have some services, and that, you could develop this kind of services as they do at Grand Sainte. And have that. But clearly, uh, I won't be able to, because it, it implies that there is some kind of uh, uh, 
international aid which kind of regulate, help this movement and uh, so that uh, we don't have a, a fortress Europe or fortress of developed economy like it's what is happening with Trump and this, uh, this wall and all that. It's uh, effectively uh, a major issue. But, uh, Question number one. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> Um, I'm Matthias from Option B2, which is macroeconomics, political economy, and finance. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Talk about your countries. Uh, and I'm from Argentina. Um, yeah. ah. Thank you. So, so okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your presentation and also for the comments. I think they were very enriching, so I want to yeah, just yeah, put yeah. that in. Um, and I think, yeah, basically, I was, I was about to ask something very similar to Luisa's comments. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to keep on with that track of thought, uh, with that train of thought. I mean, in academia, we tend to we tend to fall to keep on discussing in terms of labor and capital, uh, particularly as post keynesian economist, or I think in the regulation school too. Uh, and sometimes the policy recommendation ends up being just increasing wage shares. So basically, going back, I mean, the, the policy recommendation is let's go back to the 50s uh, sometimes. And <laughs> my, my question, well, I tend to see the world more as the, the guys were discussing before in terms of groups of interest, heterogeneous that tend to, that claim for income and claim for rights. Uh, and I think sometimes we oversee that, we tend to omit that heterogeneity of claims, uh, which is definitely very important in the creation of a left-wing alliance. But my question basically is, is do you think it makes sense in, in terms of academic work to keep on using labor and capital as the main cleavage, as the main axis of analysis? Or you think that's kind of, we should overthrow that uh, <laughs> somehow? Uh, yeah. difficult, difficult to overthrow, but uh, uh, you can say that the spirit of my paper is specifically broadening these things because it is constraining. We keep capitalism and populism, but uh, so managed and so monitored that uh, it, it, it will help to. Uh, we, we could change the world and have a, a, a compromise of uh, more something like uh, uh, organization of citizens' activities and markets, huh? something like that. But. Uh, uh, effectively, you, it could be in the conclusion, it's a good suggestion to put in the conclusion whether this duality is still there and whether the basically uh, labor capital compromise seems to assume that um, the emancipation, you have to be a wage earner to be a citizen. Where precisely? Uh, what I am suggesting in this uh, modern two capitalism is precisely that you can be a citizen without being a wage earner. If it is the answer to your, but I am a bit trapped for that, and I would have, I would have liked to end my paper with this question. <laughs> So hello, my name is Louis. Uh, I'm French from Option B2, which is uh, also macroeconomics and finance. So um, maybe I will get back to one of your claims that uh, finance was never a political platform. I didn't ah. quite that I didn't quite get it because, uh, in my view of the political records of I mean of the deregulation of finance and that kind of things with the repeal of the glass steel Act or even the claim that you mentioned of François Hollande can be uh, by and large considered as a kind of lie to win the election, basically. So how, how I can you elaborate on the fact that uh, finance was never some kind of political platform? Yeah. Uh, no, but um, well for, for Hollande, uh, uh, my translation, according to Danny, <laughs> is a bit strong. Finance is my enemy. It's more finance is my opponent, would you say? Bon, so it's not such a strong bashing. But you can find extremely bashing statements from people uh, in, in, in high position in the system. You are right that about the Glass-Steagall Act, I, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, different. It's more of a political issue. But remember, it's, it's a, a 
everything else, it's a, a minor adjustment in the sense that the black Stigel Act was very strong. It it uh, forbidden uh, for it forbid the the come on. Uh, you, huh? Yes, and uh, you had to be in what bank? I mean, it's, uh, I am close to my. Uh, uh, there are very strong statements. I think it's maybe Jefferson wrote. Uh, I like my banker if he is my in the vicinity. If I can help to grasp him, and uh, so uh, it it needed for them to have this branching, branching, not universal banking, but the branching, the fact to have settlement and all that uh, network. And all that. So. That it needed some adjustment, but it was never part of the big game of the election and presidential. That's what I mean. It has never been posted in you know, the program of candidate. You won't find. You won't find less liberalized finance. There may be some adjustment like that, but otherwise it's more, much more restrictive. That's. But it. Uh, I mean, I should have more support into that from political scientists looking at the position of banking in that respect. But clearly, that's what I was heading at. It's, uh, there are adjustments which are not in the main program of the big candidate, which are not being real crucial debate as can be with societal things or other things. That's can I just a quick yeah. comment? It's just, that, it's just that there is a whole literature on the process of financialization in France. Yes, yeah. And if you look at this, I mean, it was mostly done through political means, actually. People in the cabinets of, for instance, Jacques Delors at the beginning of the 80s that were, mm. you know, um, socialized with that kind of ideas yeah. and of no. good governance. Well, that was the sense mm. of my question. Yeah. No, but I said it was a di diversion because I disagree with my colleagues and don't call that a regime, especially because of this poor political backing. There is no consensus. If you have these structural forms, to change that, there was no support for that. But you are right to say that in cabinet they were adjusting things. And okay. Uh, th uh, there may be some uh, key issue like uh, regulation Q or things of the, the US, which have to do with when you limit the things that you can give as guarantee. In some, sometimes, especially for the retreats for the retirement uh, cases. So when it touches to retirement, when you have capitalization, you know, it's not by repartition, by distribution, but then you, you may have more political issue, which has been uh, a major, uh, it has been an important issue in the US, definitely. But uh, by and large, I will think that, uh, although I'm not an expert, that I can find studies which shows the, I mean, the idea of silent revolution is about that. I will take Gill, okay? You read Stephen Gill, this idea of silent revolution is exactly that. Um, yeah, to have a support for this stance. Uh, hello, my name is Mateus from Brazil, from Option B, Macroeconomics and, fi and Finance. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. And well, uh, I totally understand your points uh, regarding the, uh, the, the policies implemented during the golden years of capitalism. I would like to know how would you counter argue uh, other uh, French authors such as Piketty, who argue that one of the main forces on it was also uh, colonial uh, extractiveness, uh, the, the inflows coming from the colonies at this moment. And also based on your answer uh, to Luisa's question, you mentioned some kind of international aid or help. Uh, help is a very nice and even cute word, but being frankly, it's basically paying back. And so first of all, I would like to know how you think on stop the new, the new ways that this happens, the, all the military interventions in other countries, all the soft power that France has, for example, in its former colonies, all the dispute that US and China has for spaces of influence, and after how to start this help or ping back or however we should label it, but in order to reduce these inequalities that Luisa mentioned, it's in uh, Milano's each book, Milanovic's book a lot, for example, and how to start fighting against it, because honestly, I don't really see it, this happening on international scale. Okay, 
Uh, again, uh, sorry for effectively, I did not mention that in these golden years of capitalism, you had this relationship, special relationship, colonial relationship, and you are right to mention that there were, uh, what is the name again, uh, uh, un unfair, unfair trade practices in that respect. Yes, that's uh, definitely a point we should be noted. It's not uh, uh, the golden years of capitalism are not only by the virtue of market and industrialization. There is also, but uh, it's also the time where some end is put to that. It should be mentioned. It's an important. It's, it's decreasing in a way, along the time of the until the 70s and all that. Would you agree or? What? Sorry, the inequality the, uh, in the uh, the within country. The exploitation of the colonial relationship. Mm, yeah, I, I, I agree. It ended it, it, more or less at some point. It should be part of the story, definitely. It should be part of the story, definitely. Okay. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, hello, my name is Chris. I'm from Option C. Uh, development. Uh, yeah, development. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, option C from development, um, microeconomics and finance, I think. And um, I wonder about, uh, you were talking, okay, you just touched a little bit upon, but um, I want to use the situation maybe and uh, as a, you as a French regulationist. And you were talking about, um, like, you were talking about the, the finance regime and I was wondering about the regulation, like, um, of of the financial system which is currently done and I guess like the the Basel Accords uh, they're not so much in in line with uh, French regulation school assumptions and and analysis I think no but I would wonder like uh, what you would think uh, about financial instability within the context of ecological transition if you maybe can like put some insights yeah yeah about that yeah uh, I mean maybe you have touch upon this subject this morning with, with Steve Keen, but uh, it's true that uh, uh, financing the, the, the green revolution or the environmental, uh, uh, backing the, the environmental challenge of I back is not at all certain, and I don't assume that at all. The only thing is that the only uh, wisdom that is forced upon the financial sector come from the insurance sector which is close to that, because the insurance sector is really worried about what is coming, okay? And I guess that uh, uh, political, I mean, the states are also, I mean, uh, the, the great financial crisis was not a minor event, so they always want time <laughs> to, cover. whether what kind of things or transformation or uh, obligation they can have in that direction, it's a, it's a big issue, it's one of the, I'm not at all uh, uh, thinking that we will gently turn towards this uh, much more open, emancipatory way for citizens. There are a lot of issues, differences uh, among countries. Uh, the fact that the, um, the global finance has been reinforced in the process of the, the GFC and not at all kind of dismantled, whether uh, the, the, the position of the insurance system will help it to kind of cool down and get more control. It's one of the big issues. And not, uh, okay. Sorry. But like specific approaches, maybe if I can. Sorry? Like follow up, uh, like uh, what are there specific uh, approaches under discussion, like in the French regulation school, um, to then regard to those physical damages, which then cause those uh, insurers to to have those those big tasks. Um, do you know if there is like uh, specific policies being discussed or something? Or no, yeah, there is a, a recent work by Aglietta and a team on the transition. You may have heard of they presented it three months ago about uh, taming or containing of finance and uh, but uh, I don't will, uh, I won't say uh, it comes to it comes down to uh, definite policies and all that <coughs> and uh, they don't discuss it in terms of uh, 
uh, whether financialization is uh, politically sustainable. Mm -hmm. they, they speak about uh, the possibility to, to pass or to act uh, some new accords uh, in that respect. But uh, I would say that financialization for a lot of regulation is, is here to stay. Eh? It's kind of a long term. Uh, <laughs> Hello, my name is Arnaud. I'm in uh, financial policy, this uh, option, and I'm from Quebec. And in Quebec right now, we have a promising um, left-wing populist party. So I was wondering, like anywhere else in the world, uh, and to me, to me, it's very um, motivating. But anywhere else, anywhere else in the world, do you see any promising? Um, uh, left-wing populist party or left-wing populist movement that we could follow or rely upon, yeah. Okay, well, well, well. Podemos, Syriza. Uh, huh? Podemos, Syriza. Oh, yeah. Quebec yeah. Solidaire, back in my place. The, what, what's the name? Quebec Solidaire. Quebec Solidaire. No, uh, I must say I'm not uh, especially, I see good ideas in some of them and uh, adapted to the local situation, like uh, Podemos who, who, who wrote. But uh, difficult to find general uh, principles and all that. If you, it's uh, may I difficult to find. Oui? Because uh, I think that the evolution of the Democratic Party in the USA is really, really interesting. And I think by now they can almost be called, uh, like at least the social, uh, socialist democratics as they call themselves, uh, can be regarded as what was termed a populist mm -hmm. leftist movement, mm -hmm. but I could also see that um, they are the reason why uh, this term of populism changes completely, because mm -hmm. if the that. Democratic Party in the USA is using policies like 70% um, or even higher marginal income tax above 10 million or something and advocates for uh, employer of last resort and 100% of uh, green energy by 2024, uh, which are policies that could be previously assigned to a leftist populist movement. I, I think that the uh, Democratic Party in the USA could be the reason why it's not called a leftist uh, populist movement anymore. Or the, like, the term populism totally changes. Yeah, this, this I agree on the change, that's what I was underlining on the change. Now it's difficult to see, uh, to see this policy outside of that context. Clear for the US, for Quebec I didn't know, but for, for Podemos it's also clear. Um, looking at them, I will, I will uh, look closely to what extent they tend to develop this uh, municipalism kind of things. For me the things would be to have uh, uh, municipalist, municipal, that is local, uh, regulated, emancipatory movement with a lot of social innovation, with uh, at the level of the nation some kind of coordination or agreement. So, but that's a that's a role. It's even more complex than looking. <laughs> I can't tell you so. Yeah, and uh, one one thing more, and I think uh, what I presented previously was like this compromise between uh, communitarian and cosmopolitanism. Uh, some women, some really diverse women in the Congress now in the U.S. have accomplished this, and they yeah. well, that's, that's good. Uh, that's they good. are able to like in Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. She's able to uh, like for two days ago, I saw her uh, entering a Twitch um, Twitch live stream. About which was fundraising for LGBTQ uh, for the LGBTQ community, and the next day she's in office, fighting for localized rights in Queens and the Bronx. And I think we have a we have to look there for seeing how to how to formulate our desires. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Come uh, what you, know I you know more than I do. I wanted to ask you maybe a few more words about. How do you think this multi-layered governance is possible? Uh, 
so going from local approaches to to global ones and if you think that like these SDGs can in a way be those kind of principles that Latour uh, say well, are too abstract in a way yeah, and like yeah. imposed from mm -hmm. from above let's say no but uh, you are, you are right this is a big a big issue is uh, this multi-layered governance because it goes back to what was said also on migration how to deal with migration how to deal with a globalized world in a way uh, it seems to me that uh, the UN is rallying uh, a lot of forces and in insisting upon these uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals and that's a, a good point at least to enter the, the the, the debate to make it real, to have a frame, to, uh, whether it accords with what you said on the US or not. Whether I mean, if if all these movements were kind of keeping in mind this and uh, and uh, entering it in their relationship with uh, central levels and all that, that would be part of the achievement. Whether it will succeed, uh, uh, we I, I I see little alternative. I see little alternative to to these movements, which are uh, supported by uh, developing countries, like developed economies, and which have uh, concrete answers, who ask for concrete answers to the deep changes that uh, local region will, will be faced with. But that's uh, kind of difficult to be more precise about that. Uh, I am engaged in uh, discussions with uh, 37 uh, small insular development states and in a way it works it gives a uh, similar combination for example <coughs> from Caribbean to Indian Ocean they can understand and share some practices and this kind of thing it gives some legitimacy to their claim claim and another uh, indicators to follow is to see whether the big um, the big sum, the big uh, uh, required by the UN for developing countries will be met or not in the coming years. You know, you, you see, uh, that this is to, to be followed. Exactly. Nothing is certain in that. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Niels. I'm French, and I come from the development option. And I had a question, which is far more um, like relating to the Gilets Jaunes movement and the treatment that the economists have had of it. And I don't know what you personally perceive uh, about how French political economists have tended to try to diagnose uh, the Gilets Jaunes movement in a, in a way very different way from what the sociologists and historians have tried to do. And what would your perception be of what came out of this? Is it? Do you understand what I mean? Or yes, yeah. uh, yes, but it's uh, uh, it's really difficult to have. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's perceived as very recent, mm -hmm. and uh, we had an idea of uh, uh, income inequality and uh, uh, as producing excluding excluding one class of uh, ma ma mainly urban poor, not integrated in the labor market, or excluded like that. Gilets jaunes is rising another issue, much more in line with uh, local things, a uh, lot of rural people. If you look at uh, the, 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 the portrait that we may have, the sociological portrait, uh, they are not very low income. Some of them are, are small entrepreneurs and all that. Uh, in that sense, they, it's part of the uh, the people intervening in the in the whole uh, movement, rural, urban type of things. It reminds the cost of cutting down public services and all that. But the suggestions are uh, not that clear of whether they go for, for example, the concrete proposition to organize specific services locally. Their claim of some kind of new democracy is interesting and well received. What will what will be the next stop? Will be to know what they want exactly. They have avoided uh, some question like migration, uh, like uh, even even on income. There is a claim for the the tax, the ISF. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but there is uh, no real claim for a big redistribution or, or support I, I, I or I basic scheme or anything like that. So it's a bit difficult to see where they are, where they are going. But they, as I said, uh, everyone agrees that they uh, are uh, raising good questions. Raising the on, on, and I like the idea on materiality of their uh, citizen project or uh, how ca concrete it can be. How it can be taken on board depends on uh, this creativity of this action, whether they will come with some formula or not. Um, we, I am not uh, ready to use analysis of economies to go much further than, than that. Uh, but, uh, that, that I do agree, but f to me, these um, political claims that they're making more and more are, in a way, diversions from what the, the movement used to be, because it's centralization and focus on certain points and leaving apart some other possible individual um, claims that were there before. And it's normal, it's like politization yeah. of a movement. What I was mon wondering about, it's kind of, economists tended to use those claims that are not what the movement socially is in a way to disclose the causes of such an uprising. And what I kind of had an impression about is that economists were tended to have no, uh, on, on this matter, uh, they tended not to look for any empirical evidence on this, leaving that to other people or just not to mm -hmm. the analysis, mm -hmm. and tended to do what they wanted with it. And I was kind of shocked in that way, in the sense that economists were not doing science and that they were kind of doing editorials on that and leaving the proper science to sociologists. And I don't know if economics actually should take care of those issues and try to tackle them, or if it just ends up being very ideological and say, look at the Gilets jaunes, it's the proof that yeah. we... No, uh, uh, as you know, economics is a dismal science. <laughs> And it has to be strongly. I mean, I am for social science. We cannot, we cannot go bowling around alone uh, in economics. Uh, we, the, the tragedy of uh, this science is to have uh, believe that they can become professional on their own, and they lost contact with some reality. And Epoch is confronted with, with that in a way that you, you, you know that you, we need to be much more working with other social science. I have quoted some political economies, sociologists some sociologists, and, uh, which are really giving us uh, insight on that. Um, I, I can only encourage you to, to collaborate with. <laughs> Was the social science, and in a way, I hope they also need our questioning or way of uh, trying to propose schemes or something. It's not as obvious because we have such a bad reputation <laughs> by now that we, to catch up uh, it will take time. But <laughs> we may, uh, well, we may make uh, also good good suggestion, but we really have to work with political scientists, sociologists, anthropology. Anthropology is important. See, if we have this principle of emancipatory and all that, and it's much easier to understand uh, nation, countries which have various level of development, what is left of their tradition, what can be put to use. And that. Was that was it. Yeah, okay, no question left. So yeah, plenty of questions are <laughs> But the session may be over, that's all. Awesome. I thank you all, and I, uh, as you know, I appreciate very much uh, the EPOC uh, program. So uh, I congratulate you to have made all these efforts. Just go on and uh, make a good uh, advertising so that it continues. And on our side, we will do our best so that it can go along. Uh, this good, very good program uh, can help all the changes we hope for in this, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank to you. you.